Oh, what is up? Welcome to Bringing the Backups. I'm your host, Eric Helwig. On the show today, we're talking about Caleb Haney. And how many Bears fans are going to remember that championship game from 2011? Caleb Haney on the show. Obviously not the real guy. But, you know, hey, if you want to get the real guy, you know, I'm not telling you guys to annoy Caleb Haney on his Instagram which is at Caleb Haney 16, and then his Twitter at Caleb Haney 12. For some reason, different numbers. I don't know why, but who cares? Harass Caleb Haney. Let's get him on the show. On this episode, I almost said show too close to it. Did you hear that? I said episode. I was going to say show. You get it. Caleb Haney. Uh, a couple dates coming up for Eric Helwig, otherwise known as myself. December 13th, you can see me in Hollywood at Bar Lubitsch at Barely Making It LA. Come on out, support the show. And then if you're in Frederick, Maryland, by any chance, maybe you're in both. Maybe you're one of those people like me that splits a lot of time between Hollywood and Frederick, Maryland. Uh, If so, you can see me headlining at the Cellar Door in Frederick. That's going to be on December 19th at 7 o'clock. Tickets to both those shows are available at erichelwick.com. And then, of course, at that same website, erichelwick.com, you can see my January dates Coming up for San Francisco Sketch Fest, my show in Moscow, Idaho, and Paris, Texas for the Tower Comedy Festival. Very excited for that. A little bit later, my guest Stephen Lolly is on the show as well. You know him from All Things Comedy. It's going to be a great show. Yamis, take it away. Grab your gear and lace it up. Helmets on and cup your nuts. It's that time you know what's up. Here we go. Bring in the back up. Welcome in to Bring in the Backups, a podcast that I refuse to quit. <laughs> I won't quit. I have a feeling one of these days it's just going to explode, you know? But until then, you know, for the 150 to 250 of you that listen to this every week, welcome back. Good to be with you. Uh, today on the show, I'm going to be talking with Stephen Lolly a little bit later. Very funny comedian I met doing uh, shows at Broadway Comedy Club West. You know him from the No Idea Zone podcast and from All Things Comedy. Very funny guy. So uh, it's a fun conversation with him. My portion of the show is going to go a little quicker today. It's a bitless show because, as you remember from my last podcast where I was like, my life has been hard. It hasn't gotten better. You know, might be heading back east to see some more family members. You know how life goes where sometimes, you know, not everybody gets to continue keep doing it. You get it. Uh, So, yeah, family stuff continues for your noble host here. And uh, what does that mean? If I've been, uh, you know, crying in my car a couple times a week, That means you don't get any pre-planned bits, all right? I've been crying in my fucking car, you selfish douchebags. You're not getting the pre-planned bits. Also, I, (laughs) in addition to, you know, uh, you know, people in my family getting sick. uh, Also, I had to take that booster shot. I say I have to take it because my wife signed me up for it. You know, I think I've talked to you guys about this before, but, you know, I, I don't know who to believe anymore, you know? Because Fauci seems like a great guy, but Joe Rogan is my favorite podcaster. So what's what's a dumbass like me supposed to do when I don't really read that much? I don't trust corporate media. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to cede all power to my wife. You know that whole, like, my body, my choice? Not if, not if you're me married to my wife. I told my wife, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. She was like, go get your booster. So I got my booster. This weekend, and my my fucking armpit hurts for like three days. I have like crazy armpit pain. Now, the articles I've read, by that I mean like the first paragraphs I skimmed said that's normal. That just means my lymph nodes are swollen in my armpit, which means the booster's working. So, uh, great, you know, whatever. Who gives a shit? Point is, my armpit hurts. I'm in a bad mood. Let's do a podcast. First off, how about this? How about we give a little shout out? 
you know, I do, I don't know if this is a happenstance, but I do a Thanksgiving Day episode about Joey Harrington going back to Detroit and, and butt-fucking the Lions on Thanksgiving. And what happens? The next week, Lions pull out their first victory of the season. Looks like someone motivated somebody else. Does that read as a lion roar? It sounds like the lion is taking a dump. I feel I feel like I might have picked a shitty sound clip for this episode. Anyway, in, in tribute to the Lions. Way to go, boys. Dan Campbell and the boys. 110 and 1. Blake and Blake. And literally. All right. How do you not root for the Lions after that, huh? I thought that was fun, watching that victory. I mean, it's just cool. I mean, it's like I, I love celebrating a, a shitty win in Week 12, like you just won the Super Bowl. I mean, good for, <laughs> good for you, boys. You got to take what you can get. And and by the way, you know, you never know, huh? Maybe the Lions go on a little run here, finish the season six ten and one. All of a sudden, things are looking bright. Did you see the clip of Dan Campbell picking up the lady owner of the Lions after the game, and they're hugging? It's very sweet. It's very moving. Uh, they might be hooking up. I don't know. I don't want to start a rumor here. Is that slander? It shouldn't be. You know, the owner and the coach hooking up. I feel like that would. I feel like that should happen more often. You know, for all the lady owners out there, it's like I think. It, Hook up with the coaches. And by the way, okay, let's get some male owners and some lady coaches, and they should hook up too, right? Am I in trouble? Who cares? Who cares? So what? Uh, Let me give a shout-out to my friend uh, Kate Gaffney, by the way. I did her podcast, Service from Hell, which I don't know when it's going to come out. Probably Probably sometime in January, I guess, but... It was really fun. She came over here. We did two hours on a podcast. Uh, really good time. Uh, we talked about like all the like waiting jobs I've had, all the customer service jobs. I, I realized in doing that podcast that I ha- I've had a, a psychopathic like list of jobs from like doing a nine eleven tour to selling timeshare. A lot of like emotionally manipulating people. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm really coming off like a piece of shit on this podcast. So anyway, it's called Service from Hell's The Pod. Definitely give her uh, a like in the uh, the Apple's, the Apple iTunes store. Although, you know, on second thought, you can also give me a like before you give her a like. All right, give me five stars and then go ahead and hook up uh, Service from Hell, my friend Kate Gaffney. Very funny. Uh, yeah, fun podcast. I met her at a party and she was like, oh, yeah, do my podcast. I was like, sure, that story sucked. Whatever. A little bit later on the show, uh, we're going to be talking about Caleb Haney. And this dude never played on the Lions. He was, uh, he had a very memorable game. Hmm? Bears fans are going to know what I'm talking about. Talking NFC Championship game, baby. I think I actually said 2010 before. It was 2011. Well, it's squares because the 2010 season, but it probably happened in 2011, right? Because at that point, we're championship games. We're two weeks out from the Super Bowl, baby. We'll talk about Caleb Haney, though. I want to give this dude his props. They are earned, my friend. So, Caleb, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, why? Why are you listening to this podcast? Come on, buddy. You got a uh, you got a, a, a solid job at uh, RBC Wealth Management as a financial advisor. I know what you're doing, Caleb. You advertised it. I found out. I read an article. Where are they now, Caleb Haney? And whenever it's you know you know it's NFL guys over the age of like 35, I'm like, hopefully not dead. You know, like that's the number one thing. It's like I just want everybody to be living. That's number one. Number two, how do they deal with the post-NFL depression? It seems like everybody has like three years where they're just wandering the earth trying to cope with not being uh, a football star anymore. And then they settle into a job. So I was glad to see Caleb uh, was able to do that. I don't know. I guess the financial advisor is good. They were saying like in the article that he like helps athletes, which I can – 
appreciate. I was just watching. Uh, I was watching Miracle. Did I talk about this last podcast? I don't remember when when I watched Miracle. Was it before the last one? Well, whatever. I watched Miracle, and then at the end of the movie, they're doing the like, and here's where they all are at the end, and they they all work for Bear Stearns. <laughs> I guess it was like before the collapse or whatever, but it was like Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns. Like after we beat the Russians in 1980, we tanked the U.S. economy. We just wanted to even it out. We didn't, you know, we did some good for America, then we wanted to really hurt it a little bit later. I'm not saying Caleb falls into that, by the way, Caleb, if you're listening. All right, you are you're doing God's work at a RBC Wealth Management. I did see some YouTube videos of uh, Caleb Haney also, like, giving advice on how to, like, drop back and pass and stuff. And the YouTube comments, it's like, man, a lot of fat pieces of shit don't mind making fun of NFL quarterbacks, huh? I mean, I know I do it on this podcast, but I acknowledge then that I, who am I? I I mean, I just bring back football players stuffing people in lockers. You know, some some of that did the body good. All right, it 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 maintained the balance in the jungle. That wasn't planned. I just said the word jungle, so I figured a lion's roar would make sense. It really doesn't sound like a lion's roar. I'm actually very disappointed with the sound. <laughs> that I downloaded. I should have spent a little more time trying to find a more convincing lion roar. One ten and one, baby. Detroit's on the come up. What else we got going on? Cincinnati in the college football playoff. That's pretty cool. Uh, big win for college football. It's not the same four teams every year. Thank you. New team gets in, not in the power five. Love it. Going to root for Cincinnati. And I'll tell you something else that I am very excited for in this podcast. If you're listening right now, I want you to pull out a pen. Pull out a pen. Let me, I'll wait. You got it. All right, here's the phone number. You're going to write down 323-716-6072. I repeat, that phone number, 323-716-6072. 6072. Now, you want to guess what that phone number is? That is the phone number to call into the show, baby. You want to call in to bring in the backups. You want to leave a voicemail as a fan. Say what's up. Tell me you love the show. Tell me you think the show sucks. Whatever. Pry deep into my personal life that I keep hinting at in the last two weeks on this show. That's the number, 323-716-6072. Leave a quick voicemail. I will play it on the show as long as there's no racial slurs. You just keep those to yourself, all right? You know, I I, I don't really want to hear that. So, you know, maybe save that for the next podcast you're calling into. But besides that, I'll put anything on the show, man. I, you know... Any content I don't have to make myself uh, is a fucking A+. plus. So call in that number again, 323-716-6072. You can call in and be a part of bringing the backups. How does that sound? That's pretty cool. Honestly, I'm pretty excited about that. My friend Rob Stern, comedian Rob Stern, uh, I was going to say his uh, Twitter handle, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Is it at the Rob Stern? Who, you know, just Google Rob Stern Twitter and you'll find his Twitter if you want to support Rob Stern. But uh, he helped me set up a Google Voice account. That's what that phone number is. I, I'm so bad with technology. Like you, uh, A lot of you are probably like, Google Voice, wasn't that like 35 years ago? Well, I whatever. I figured it out this week. <laughs> So now there's a way to call into the show and leave messages, which which I am excited about. Get some, uh, we get some celebrities calling into the show. Get some former guests checking in. I think that'll be really nice. So enjoy that. Have fun with that. You guys get homework for this week, huh? You call into the show. 
you at message Caleb Haney and tell him he should come on the show. We got to get that second quarterback. I, I, I owe Gus Farratt one more follow-up. I really got to get Gus Farratt. You know, I thought I had Tyler Thigpen. Thought I had Gus Farratt. I think I was close to Charlie Fry. I got, you know, I, I, we got to get at least one a season. I know I'm only five episodes into season two, but we got to get at least one this season, preferably two. You know, kick it up a notch. Every season, get one or two more backups. That's the goal. So you guys know what to do, huh? I call, call in Backups Nation or the Backies. I can't remember. I, th- I thought we came up with a name for you guys, but I don't remember it. <laughs> you can message me at Eric Helwig on Instagram and Twitter if you uh, remember the name that we came up for <laughs> for the fans of the show. Uh, obviously, it caught on. I mean, what else before we get into Caleb Haney? You know, I'm gonna like I said, I'm only doing like 30 minutes up top. I want to keep this nice and quick, but excited for Army Navy. As you guys know, I'm an Army football fan. We got the Navy midshipmen coming up. I hope it's uh, I hope it's a blowout, but you know, I still respect the Navy dudes as well. You know, I'm not like a normal Army fan where I'm like, we gotta beat them. I'm like, you know, I'm if Navy wins, it's not the worst deal. You know, you're both doing brave things. I didn't go to either school, all right. But I'm excited for the Army-Navy game. It's always a lot of tradition fun. I think it's like the best college football has to offer. Then Army got the uh, bowl game against uh, Mizzou. Love that. SEC team, I'll take that. 6-6 six and six Missouri. I think we can take them. Excited about that. Uh, we did a, oh, I should say this too. Went to a Hanukkah party. Which is nice. I feel like I'm learning a little bit more about Judaism every year. You know, I didn't know much um, until I I moved to New York. And then everybody I knew was Jewish. And now I live in L.A. where everybody I know is Jewish. So, like, every year I get a little, like, a little more. I get it a little bit more. Like, like I'm now figuring out that it's, like, an, an ethnicity and a race. You know? Like, you can be Jewish, but, like, not believe in God. And that, I mean, that just, as a Catholic, I'm like, whoa, whoa. And again, not a practicing Catholic, just a a guilty about sex Catholic. But it's crazy. Like, people do, like, they they sing the the Jewish songs, but it's, it's, it's for the ethnicity part. It's not about the religion part. Blown away. I mean, still, like I said, at 36, you learn something new every day. The Hanukkah party, I was like, wow, this is uh, this is cool. I like that you cannot believe in the Lord. Well, I guess they still believe in God. Well, I guess no, that's the whole point is that some people don't. So you can be like agnostic or even an atheist. It's crazy. As, I, as I'm talking now, I'm like, I feel like if I go long enough, this is going to become a hate crime by accident. So let me just get off the fucking topic. But the point is, Hanukkah had a very nice time at the uh, Hanukkah potluck. Could only eat like three foods there because, you know, with the whole celiac, I got my stomach appointment coming back up for celiac too where they, you know, test my blood and they're like, how's your poop been? (laughs) I'm like, good. That'll be nice to just get the uh, get the stomach appointment out of the way. I got to go like once a year, so I'm just going to make it like a Christmas thing, you know. Every morning, every Christmas morning, I go into the doctor and talk about my poop. We got Army Navy. We got Cincinnati football. We got my stomach appointment with the doctor. We've covered everything. Now it's time. Caleb Haney. And let's talk about that 2010 game, right? Bears Packers at Soldier Field. Negative 98 degrees. Uh old like fucking 
I don't give a shit face, Jay Cutler. <laughs> that, guy is, that guy is cursed with a face of not caring. And here's the thing. Maybe he does care a lot when he played, and maybe he doesn't. But either way, his face is not helping. He's got the worst competitor face. I don't know. I know he went to Vanderbilt. I'm assuming they were not good when he was there. They, I mean, for, I, when he was there, I'm sure his senior season, they went like 6-6. Six and six. That would be my guess. I would Google it right now, but I don't want to take away from Caleb Haney's podcast by Googling Jay Cutler's college stats. But that would be my guess. Okay, I'm, what am I saying? I'm looking it up right now. Let's look up. Let's look up Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler's Vanderbilt stats. Man, I love those Vanderbilt uniforms. Black and gold, they look pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to his college career here. As a four-year... Yeah, they don't mention their record. Okay, look at this. Jesus Christ. The Commodores were 11-35 and 35 during his tenure, including 5-27 and 27 versus the SEC. So, yeah, they sucked. They It sounds like they didn't win anything. While he was there, it's just hard. It's just hard to compete at Vanderbilt. Anyway, again, not the point. Caleb Haney, backing up Jay Cutler and Todd Collins, who's got to be on this podcast at some point. Uh, both of them go down in the championship game against Aaron Rodgers. This is the season that the Packers win the Super Bowl. But it was close to not happening for the Packers because Caleb Haney kept him in the game. Bears fans know this. First off, he's throwing off his back foot. The dude has an arm. I'm telling you, Caleb Haney looks good in the game. Yes, he throws a very infamous touchdown to B.J. Raji. He was like a defensive lineman in the Packers, on the Packers. For some reason, he was playing like free safety on a play and like picks off a crossing pattern and, and takes it to the house. A little pick six action. But besides that, Besides the pick six to a defensive tackle, I thought Haney looked pretty good in that game. And he ends up, I think uh, I think it was the next season early on in 2011, um, uh, Cutler gets injured again, so Haney starts four games, and they, they go 0-4. That's kind of the end of his. He's still kicking around the league after 2011. I mean, he stayed with, yeah, he stayed with the Bears from 2008 to 2011. Then he's on the Broncos, Ravens, Browns, and Cowboys. He's out of the league by 2014. I mean, geez, he probably had some really good. I mean, geez, wait, if he was on the Broncos in 2012, he was backing up. Hey, he's backing up uh, Peyton Manning then because he was there then. Wow. Ravens 2013, that would have been Flacco. I don't know. I don't know who he couldn't beat out on the Browns and the Cowboys, but at that point, you know, it's who cares? It's over. But I mean, he so he played behind Manning. That's good. I mean, look, I I thought just watching his highlights straight up. I mean, he looked pretty good. I mean, the Colorado State. That's where he went to college. He had some solid numbers there. Take a look at these college numbers, huh? Look at me with the with the. The research, 39 touchdowns, only 34 picks. Completion percentage of 61%, over 6,000 yards, huh? Two-year starter, junior and senior, I'll take it, Caleb Haney. He seems like a cool dude. He seemed to take it in stride. I would say that, like, in all his interviews, all his interviews are like, uh, hey, what's up, Caleb Haney? Tell us about the NFC Championship game. Everybody just goes to that right away. And he's, you know, he's not like, you know those actors who, like, they have one role, and then people are like, oh, hey, hey, can you say, uh, you know, it's Joey from Friends. Hey, can you say, how you doing? And the actor's like, go fuck yourself. No, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to do the one thing that everybody wants me to do. Caleb Haney's not like that. He's not like, no, no, you know, I, I, you know, I played a lot of other games, and uh, 
you know, I won a, I won this bowl game in college. He's like, let's talk about the interception to the fat dude. Let's come on. Let's get into it. Like he knows what, why people want to talk to him. He doesn't shy away from it. I love it. It reminds me very much of Gus Farad, not running away from the headbutt. That's how you got to be, especially in the NFL, because again, you got so many people watching. I mean, it's so insane to think about coming in on that stage in the NFC Championship game, like you're the third string quarterback and all of a sudden you're playing for the Super Bowl. In like I what I think, I think the Bears and Packers might be like the the rivalry with the most games played in the NFL. I think it I mean they've been in the same division the whole time. It's got to be close. I don't know who else would have played more often. The point is, is like that's a that's a legendary matchup in an NFC Championship game to come in cold off the bench. I mean, dude, that's just what that's just some once in a lifetime shit. So good. I mean, look, good for him, man. I, I think it's uh, it's too bad he didn't get a chance to really play any anywhere else. But look, uh, he was an undrafted free agent in 2008, lasted in the league from 2008 to 2014. What is that? 8, 9, 10. That's seven years. Bro, Caleb Haney, we salute you. All right, Good-looking guy, too. You know, I'll give him his credit. He's kind of a jacked dude. A little top-heavy, you know, for a quarterback. I would say. This is the dumbest... Uh, analyzing of a quarterback ever. Too too beefy up top. Yeah, it looks like he was kind of like on practice squads for the last three years. Ravens, uh, Ravens, Browns, Cowboys, he wasn't really playing. But at least on the Broncos, he was active roster, looks like, for the majority of the season. 2012. Well, good for him. Good for you, Caleb. If you're out there, man. I mean, look, the thing is, is Manning was playing so crappy towards the end of his career. It's like Caleb Haney could have beat him out. It probably wasn't that far. Because remember, like, didn't Peyton have, like, something with his neck where he's like, like, they were like, he'll never play again. That's the whole reason the Colts let him go. But then he uh, he got better. He got, like, a package sent to his house in his wife's name. Isn't that what happened? He got a package that was not from the Unabomber. <laughs> he got something in the mail. I remember that was like a thing, but I don't, I, I again, I don't, uh, I'm not going to Google the exact. I'm just going to slander Peyton Manning. Here's the thing. If these guys are having to do some sort of special drug to stay on top, I, I guess it doesn't really bother me that much. I mean, like, I don't know. It's one thing if it's like if it's making you stronger, but if it's like helping you recover, I don't know. I I guess I'm 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 probably gonna contradict myself next week. I'll be like, get all the cheaters out of here. But depending on how I feel in the moment, sometimes I'm like, you know, my 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 opinion will change. But right now, I gotta say, like Peyton Manning, he gave us he gave us some good years on the Broncos. So whatever he had to do to get himself there, you know, we salute you. Although that said, if he if he did play it real, maybe Caleb Haney could have beat him out. So I don't know. I don't know how Caleb feels about that. We should get him on the podcast to uh, to talk about <laughs> at Caleb Haney twelve on Twitter. Come on, Caleb. This photo of him on his Wikipedia page, he's got some pretty. He's got like some long hair. It looks like he's kind of rocking like the like the youth pastor long <laughs> long locks as you sing with guitar to a group of children look. And he is a religious dude. I did see that. I, I see he's a he's a man of the Lord. I mean, that pretty much covers it. There, there there's not much too much else to say about this guy other than he got dropped into something crazy. You know, overall NFL stats, three touchdowns, ten picks. You know, nothing to nothing to write home about. But, you know, one hell of a game at the time it mattered most. 
kept them close. You know, with a third string quarterback against Aaron Rodgers, you're like, dude, this should be a cakewalk. That's also that's Aaron Rodgers. Like in his prime, dude. That's his Super Bowl season. And it came pretty close to getting fucked up. A for effort, man. And with that, that's going to sound like I edited, but I didn't. All right. I just, I ended, I roared, and now we transition to the interview. Uh, Stephen Lolly, as I was telling you guys before, uh, he is very funny. I met him at a show. I recorded this interview like eight months ago, so I have no idea how dated it is. I, you know, <laughs> apologies if we're referencing things that don't exist anymore. <laughs> But uh, whatever. Uh, Steven's a very, uh, very funny guy. We've uh, we've stayed buddies since he came on the show. Really, I just met him at the uh, met him doing stand up. Didn't know him. Just came to ask him to do my podcast because he was wearing a Walter Payton jersey. And I was like, "Hey, funny comic, likes football. He's a Chicago fan. Hence, picking a Chicago less uh, legend for the show in Haney." But yeah, I really got to know him on the podcast and then uh like I said been you know he's a he he's not I don't know if he's a friend yet this is the worst intro ever <laughs> he's become a comedy acquaintance and we you know we text about open mics and shit <laughs> we text about r- workout rooms we can go work in uh anyway I'm uh I was really happy to have him on the show I think you guys are going to enjoy our conversation uh we had a we had a great time He's got a great disposition. Oh, He's a very, uh, from the very friendly dog. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. And I, I have something. I mean, I've seen him fuck twice, and he's definitely. Uh, he goes to town. <laughs> so, considering uh, his body type, <laughs> that would be a very entertaining thing to see, dude. So he loves golden retrievers. That's his thing. Uh, he's bisexual. He fucks male and female dogs. We took him to Runyon. And uh, there was, like, a golden retriever. They just, like, sniffed for literally three seconds. She turned over. He started, like, pile driving. Yeah. He's in the right town now to be by. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's like know. he's going to get... If he was an actor dog, he'd be getting yeah. a lot of opportunities yeah, based be. off Absolutely. of that. Yeah, that's a very diverse choice. Yep. <laughs> he'd be disappointed you guys moved out of West Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was missing the parades. No, he... Uh, we then we took we took him home and he started fucking my brother's golden retriever. Uh, what's his name? Oh fuck! What's his name? Ned. He's a my brother is a beautiful golden retriever that Gordon just really he laid him out, bro. It was it was, it was a little it was tough to watch. I mean, not I didn't watch. I saw it. I shouldn't say watch. It was tough to witness until I broke it up. But then here, here's was a, the retriever enjoying it? Yes, but it was. It looks violent. I, that's what it's just. You said lover. I think I we should spend a lot of time on the podcast talking about how my dog fucks. But you it's, know, it, I, it's a it's a good pivot for ratings. <laughs> Look, you know, he's a pit bull. He's got a lot of power. That's that's all I'm saying. He's people are very interested in the the goings and comings of pets these days. So I don't understand why it wouldn't be a good top conversation. Why talk sports? I've heard when you talk sports, you lose half your crowd. You lose half your, (laughs) that's what we would say on Pepitone. As soon as he and I would start talking Yankees, Cubs, or Bears, you know. Nobody uh, cares. No. Yeah, yeah. We would lose half the crowds. But animals. You know what's interesting is I don't, I will go on this podcast a lot and not talk about uh, sports. And people are like you, you, dude, you never mention it. But then, the episodes where I do that get way more listens. Like I, I literally watch people enjoy it more, right? When I don't talk about Nick Foles in an episode. Wow, that's but when so that funny. Com- but when yeah, that comes up, it just fucking plummets. That was going right to be one of the big topics of our our discussion. Today. That's why we connected. Is Nick Foles? I, mean, right? I haven't. You're the you're the only person I know that's a Bears fan. That's like we never gave Nick Foles a chance. 
Well, we did give Nick Foles a chance. Uh, so get the fuck out of my get the fuck out of here. We did we did give Nick Foles a <laughs> Shortest chance. Shortest podcast but ever. <laughs> he's a better quarterback than Andy Dalton. I mean, uh, of course, you know he's a winner, and I like him. And you know, I just you can't. They would. They didn't know they were going to get Justin Fields. You know, they didn't know yeah, yeah, they yeah. were going to get him in the draft. So they got this Dalton who. Maybe one of the few quarterbacks who was bet, like worse than Jay Cutler. Like I think Dalton yeah, yeah. was even not as even good as Jay Cutler. But uh you know, I think Kaepernick and Dalton were maybe less a fa- and I am not and not about Kaepernick's politics. Yeah, yeah. Just he threw a lot of interceptions the last few seasons he was in the NFL. And I would always look at the stat line and I'd go, Man, there's not a lot worse than Jay Cutler, but Dalton He's really bad. <laughs> you know, of course, we go out and get him, pay him $10 million. And then um, I don't know how mobile he is. Maybe they don't have to change the offense so much for Justin Fields from him to Fields. I just don't understand why they wouldn't consider Nick Foles because um, the offensive line fell apart, and that was what, why the Bears started losing because initially they were winning with Foles. Yeah, dude. I mean, when, when he came in, uh, when he came into that – Falcons game and threw 13 touchdowns in the second <laughs> half. Three touchdowns uh, in like eight minutes. It was amazing. And I was just like, that's the magic. That's right. the... Look, I look. as an Eagles fan, I could talk forever about the fact that we didn't commit to him after he won us the Super Bowl. Yeah, that is... It's, it's just... be. It's one of those beyond me moments where I'm like... It, it's just people who don't... It's just people who think that they're smarter than magic. Like it, it really is that simple. It's like it, it doesn't matter why. I was as a Bear fan. I was relieved when they didn't. Then the Eagles didn't sign Nick, resign Nick Foles. I was like, oh, I'm glad they made that mistake. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm glad Foles is out of the NFC now. Now he's going to uh, Jacksonville. And when he came to the Bears, I didn't think he was a hero or savior or anything. But I thought I like him. Yeah. And he he beat fucking Tom Brady. He beat Tom Brady twice. He beat Tom Brady on Monday Night Football, and Brady wouldn't shake his hand. Remember that? Did you oh, see dude. that? I'm going to close the door real quick. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it was yeah. amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, you as a Bear fan, you know, if you're really reading the bylines and the stat lines, you really know what's going on. You know that the this offensive lineman got hurt. These offensive linemen are out. And you know, we lost a couple offensive linemen. James Daniels. Um, our center got hurt temporarily and Foles not being a mobile quarterback was the recipient of that, that, you know, disintegration. Yeah. And that, but they also changed the offense to suit Foles from Trubisky because Trubisky would do all this movement. And it, so there was this little musical chairs the bears played in last season where first they were winning and then Trubisky sucked. So with the coaches knew, so they put in Foles. The Bears kept winning miraculously. Then the offensive line, but they adjusted the offensive line for Foles, just like they did from Carson Wentz. Yeah. When Carson Wentz left, they had to make an adjustment in order for him to, because he's a different quarterback, different kind of quarterback. I think Alshon Jeffrey was catching a lot more balls from Foles than he was from Wentz, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So they're two just different guys, different schemes. So they went to the then they went to Foles and he was winning, and he made this speech about how we're five and one. Who cares how we're winning? We're five and one. And then of course the, then they started losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right after, but the the offensive line started getting hurt. But they blamed it on Foles. They blamed it on Foles. I'm not saying Foles is fucking. He's fucking Peyton Manning, <laughs> but um, you know then Foles got hurt. Foles wasn't pulled. Foles got hurt. And then Trubisky came back in for the last third of the season. And the Bears won some games in the last, you know. But it, what they had to do with reconfiguring, they had to, the, the offensive line was so bad that Trubisky improved because he was moving around. Yeah, yeah. And that was the only way that offensive line could show misdirection or could confuse the defense was for Trubisky, them to not know which way Trubisky was going to go, right? Yeah. So it was a pretty big clusterfuck. I, and I'm not saying, again, Foles is the greatest thing, but... He's better than Andy Dalton. I mean, now the question is, are you going to have to, is it, you're going to bring Justin Fields in like in four gate week four or something? Yeah, yeah. So the transition from Dalton to 
impact fields might be a less complicated one than the one from Foles to Fields. It's always it's always a better transition when the player coming in is significantly better. That though <laughs> that always will make it a little bit easier when one guy has way more talent. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Every, everything seems to run a little bit better when that's the case. True, but fo- I don't think Trubisky was more talented than Foles. And oh, I do. You I do? do. And I look I look I I love Nick Foles. I do think uh I do think Trubisky's I'm surprised you don't stick up for Trubisky more just based on the fact that he was going by Mitch and he was like actually it's Mitchell because that's literally identical to the conversation we had. Oh. Moments ago with the Steve Steven thing. Oh, I didn't, but I didn't know that about. You didn't know that about? No. Because he was Mitch Trubisky. Right. Mr. Biscuit. The coach would call him Mr. Biscuit. He was a Southern, uh, his Southern draw and they would make fun of his. So he was like, I'm Mitchell. Well, well, here's the thing. In the old NFL, they would, you know, beat rookies to death. In this NFL, that's very bad for your mental health if someone calls you an extra couple syllables on your name. So. (laughs) That was a no go. So he said, "I'm Mitchell." He was like, "It's Mitchell," and that was like I, th- I want to say it was before the NFL draft. He went okay. from Mitch to Mitchell, or told people, "I prefer Mitchell." Okay, does that change anything for you? No, no. But I could see why it, it, Trubisky w- could do amazing things. He was a great, he's, he's a talented guy, but he couldn't do basic things. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't. He couldn't make basic throws and reads, and you know we're. We're 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 going down to the fourth quarter in teams we should be kind of annihilating, and we're we're tight in the fourth quarter because Trubisky can't make basic you know a twenty yard read or thirty yard read you know he can't he can't hit these he can't hit these throws over seven or eight ten yards he can't hit a long throw um, and uh, now I mean maybe if Wims catches that touchdown that hit him between the eight and the three in in New Orleans in the wild card game oh you're talking maybe. About- Maybe we're talking about a whole different thing because maybe the Bears win that game because they had the momentum and they were playing well and they didn't get blown out by New Orleans. Um, so maybe, yeah. But the, every the air just went out of Chicago after he just dropped that ball. Yeah, yeah. Trubisky threw about a seventy yard bomb that was beautiful. So I, you know, who knows, man? I think that's well. Look, this is the whole. You're stumbling into the point of my podcast, which is like, I think there's ten, f- ten or fifteen great quarterbacks that are just above everybody else, and then the rest you could interchange based on personalities, systems, and would be just as successful as the next guy. Like, I don't think there's that big of a difference from the 30th best quarterback and the 50th best quarterback. Well, are there even that many? You just add up the backups, 32 yeah. teams, backups, yeah, yeah. 64 guys. True. I think anybody in the NFL— So who, who would be those kind of quarterbacks? Is just, just throw For me, me? Yeah, some names of those, of those interchangeable— Hmm. Gardner Minshew. Gotcha. If you're telling me Gardner Minshew didn't have all the full weight of Bill Belichick game planning and, like, we're going to build a team or, like, that they, the Patriots couldn't go to the playoffs with him as quarterback? Right. They could. How, how do you feel about the guy they just drafted uh, from— uh, Trevor uh, Lawrence? No, Alabama. Um, Mac Jones, they, they just Oh, I'm sure guy. he'll be—I'm sure he'll be great. But it's like, I think he'll be great because he's going he's to a system, great right. system. That's yeah, right, it's right, like, right. it's so not— I don't know. Like, I bet Cleo Lemon could have been great. Like, it's just, but they just plugged got- in uh, Cam Newton, who's a really talented quarterback into that system. Was he playing hurt? Or I don't remember. I think he was playing hurt. He's playing hurt. Okay. And he's old. True. And when you get old and, like, you're, you, one of your big skill sets is bowling over people and now you're, now you're right. injury prone, like. Right. He was, never, he was never a great pocket passer, and now that's what they need him to do, and he's just not. I mean, look, I, maybe he'll be better. I mean, who knows? But yeah, I don't think, uh, I think it's probably over for Cam. As a starter, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, look, you were talking about. I want to. I want to give you some props because you were talking about Mitchell not doing the basic things. As a as a podcast guest, you've already exceeded what a lot of podcast guests do. I forgot to close the door. I got up. I was away from my mic for ten seconds. Oh, and I kept talking. You kept talking and like kind of made it like I was still in the conversation. That's a expert podcast guest move. Oh wow! So that's the kind Shit. of. That's, That's the kind of execution that you were Trubisky, looking for. From a Trubisky me. podcaster couldn't have pulled He would have just off. sat. He would have gone on Mitch. He, he Mitchell. Gone, he would have gone like this. <laughs> he just waited for you. would have heard the door close in the background. Well, I, was on, I was on a podcast for two years as Eddie Pepitone's co-host, and there were times when, 
either I had to go run out to the bathroom or he, something happened and he had to go and I would, you know, you just learn that pretty quick. And if you're in a studio, like all things comedy, you're you're like, I better step my game up. This is not, this is not the, uh, they're not fucking around. This is not amateur. Yeah. This is like, what was it like working with Eddie? I'm curious. It was amazing, man. To be honest, it was, um, I needed it emotionally. Like I would go, it would, it would recharge me and make my week better. It was like therapeutic. It was therapeutic. Yeah. Imagine just an hour of riffing with Eddie Pepitone. I mean, and, and yeah, no, it's it it's, was beautiful. It was it was beautiful, and um, uh, yeah. I mean, I I just it was stimulating. It was beautiful. It was. I would always look forward to seeing him. Um, I really love the guy, and uh, it reminded. It actually probably helped my stand up in ways that I didn't understand because I'm yeah. having such a hard time getting back to my old self as a stand-up after this year and a half, which I'm sure everybody is having a hard time, but I, I was getting into a fifth gear. I was getting into a fifth gear, like yeah. a Chappelle gear. I was hitting enough. Now, I, I'm not well-known, and nobody really gives a shit how good you are in L.A. They just care about your credits. <laughs> but it was fun to go blow people off the stage yeah. who had better credits than me, and I could come in like Clint Eastwood in High Plains Drifter in places, and I was doing that. I was doing that a lot, and I, I, looking back on it, it I didn't understand it. Well, a lot of it was being with Eddie every week for an hour. Yeah, it's like a very interesting way to view. I think, I, you know, when I listen to Burr's podcast, I think that. I'm like, somebody who can do it as well as, like, just a podcast solo like that, where ideas are coming up, and there you can see stuff getting formed. I'm like, yeah, you can see how that's so applicable to stand-up. And like, I, I mean, look, I started this podcast during the pandemic. I needed something creative to do. I was losing my fucking mind. And I definitely think like coming back from the pandemic, having done, been doing this for a year made a huge difference on stage. Like I didn't feel that uncomfortable. I was watching a lot of comics be as bad as they've been in years with a lot of audiences being more excited than they've been in years. Like a weird combo. And I kind of felt like I hit the ground running getting back from COVID because I've been doing this like this makes a difference in like your mentality, I think. Yeah, I actually am thinking about it as you're talking. I think because of this type of stand up I do is I talk spontaneously a lot like Eddie. I'm not as good as him. Obviously, I'm nowhere near as good as him, but I talk. Part of it is me thinking in the moment and creating and going with that stream of consciousness. The talking with him would help me process stuff would come up and we talk about whatever was going on and that was an extra process an extra processing step you know sure, to sure. go into going into being on stage and being a little more confident oh well i've already thought about that and talked about it a few times as opposed to just keeping it in a vacuum in your in your yeah. vault and going <laughs> oh i should tinker with this and you know me with paper is is like fucking bullshit yeah. Like putting it down on paper, even when I was 19 and I started, I put it down on paper thinking like I was going to sit like I was in a think tank or something. And I was going to engineer this like some kind of fucking like, I don't know, architect or something. And of course, it's like that never works. And and um, I, I fantasize in my laziness that I, that that would work, that I could just write it out and be like Ray Romano and write it out exactly the way I'm going to deliver it. But yeah. the talking with Eddie every week was like a. I don't know. There was something happened and I wasn't conscious of it until this past year and a half where I was in my brain started getting cobwebs and my sure, brain sure. I started getting brain fog and that and everything starts slowing down and you, the synapses aren't firing. And um yeah. How something. old are you? Is that an age thing? But <laughs> How I, old are you? I, well, dude, I was I'm 45, but I was okay. doing it fine before. Maybe I just <laughs> I just 43 was like the but I, like, I turned 44. Yeah, so maybe I just turned forty four, and it was like now it's you're and now, now you're on the official. I'm on the dementia slope. list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a slow, it's a slow crawl. That's it. Thanks, thanks. By I the just, way, I just want, yeah, no problem, man. I just wanted to. Really <laughs> There's nothing feel, I can do really about it. Feel good about uh, that. I'm so happy now. No, man, you're. Uh, it, it, I think I totally hear what you're saying, and it's like, especially like you know, Eddie Pepitone's like a all time great comedian. So it's like that. That's like that's a comedy workout. That's a comedy workout not a lot of people will ever have. Here's a crazy fact. Eddie Pepitone never saw me do stand-up live. For a year I was on his podcast. He had never seen me. 
Really? No. How'd you get the gig? Good. See, the good question. So I met Eddie at the store. I had headlined the main room on an off night. A woman named Cindy Liebman. She would produce a show every month, and she asked me to be one of her headliners. It's not a comedy store show, but it's one of their the shows they farm out. And I, I kind of said to myself, I kind of met everyone. This is 2017. I met everyone up there. People were really respectful and loving to me. And I was like, I need to keep coming here so these people don't forget who I am. You know, I just need to hang out at the store. I'm not a paid regular, but I headlined the main room. I need to come hang out. Yeah. So I drag my ass up once every couple of weeks, once a week or once every two weeks. Because my friends are regular, Sam Tripoli and Ian Edwards, and those are my friends, you know, I've known a long time. I didn't need to make yeah. an appearance and see everybody and just, you know, not be lazy, you know, and um, not be e- e- in my ego like, oh, I'm not going to have spots, so I shouldn't go hang out. No, I should go hang out. So one of those nights, Sam was there, and I t- texted him, I'm going to come to the store tonight. And he was in the, I saw him in the parking lot, and he was, you know, I was like, oh, he's talking to somebody. And I went over there, and it was Eddie. And Eddie and I... I don't know what even was Sam, where even Sam went. Eddie and I hit it off, and yeah. I said, hey, man, I would love to send you some stand-up, you know, of my stand-up. And he said, oh, yeah, send it to me, and here's my number. And it was just completely cool. And um, we were, but we were, you know, brother from another mother, like when you meet somebody and you're like, I, this is, there's a familiarity there, sure. or a rapport, and it was immediate. And... Um, he a few months later he we were hanging out we would get coffee and talk comedy and stuff and obviously we were running in different circles he's you know just getting on in places where i'm not booked or from i'm not familiar they don't know me and um and it wasn't at the point in the relationship where i was like eddie could you help me get some spots in where you're on at so it wasn't like I, i wasn't comfortable yet to ask for that but we did have a conversation where he said um he said, I need to be the star. He goes, I need to be the front, the headliner, the star of whatever I'm doing. And I said, man, that's fine with me. I just want to write for you. That's what I want to do. Yeah. And he goes, oh, all right. And, but then some months went by, and um, I texted him in the, around the Oscars. So it was like February of 2018 or January of 2018, and I texted him some really bitter, just, to, just destroying the Oscars, you know, or something. You're not a big fan? Well, I mean, uh, I just, there was, it was, I don't know. It was just, I was being irreverent. Okay. What, I don't remember I what I texted him, but it, it was funny. And he texted me back, hey man, you want to be my podcast uh, sidekick on our co-host on my podcast? And I was a little intimidated. I was like, oh shit. And then I thought about it for about 30 seconds. I went, yeah, absolutely. I would yeah. love to do that. So he had me on. <clears throat> we did one. First one was a little weird. Because, uh, first of all, I had not really podcasted ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been guests. Yeah. I'd been a guest on other people's podcasts, but I'd never, uh, you know, and I certainly wouldn't had never gone toe-to-toe, you know. But it's all free form, which is perfect for me because I'm like him. So he just kind of goes. The first one was a little weird. Um, so the second one, I came out swinging, and I took over. And uh, he had, you know, we have people call in and the people calling in the fans were like, I didn't appreciate his aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, good, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, but I, but I marked my territory and then I dialed it back a little from there. And, um, we just, and then after two, I had the calibration, I I had it down and it was just, uh, from there it was great. And then I started writing for him and I pitched a show to, um, all things comedy. That's the studio that we had our podcast at. And they took it and made made an episode. And we were going to make multiple episodes, but the pandemic shut everything down. But it's called Comedians Without Cars Getting Sewed. It's a parody of uh, Seinfeld's. Sure, sure. So it's Eddie on a you know Lark scooter or a Lime scooter or something going and taking Sam Tripoli <laughs> out for for uh, soda, and uh, or yeah. So so I, we created that together, and then I we co created a TV show that is still being uh, possibly. So anyway. But that's how it started, but yeah, that's yeah, um, that, that's that's what it is now. So we're, it's a good. I like that it starts with like a little bit of the release of the ego, because like that's such a huge thing for comics to be to be like I'm gonna go hang without the spot, and I feel like that's a thing that happens in L. A. more than it even happened. Like I mean, where I came from in New York, it was like I would only go places if I had a spot, and you it was easier to get spots, 
But like that's kind of like the melding of like the New York mind of like someone's just gonna fucking find me, man. You know, I'll just sit in the back with my arms folded and not meet anybody after the show and I'm just gonna crush so hard. And it's like LA, it's like people do only the promotion stuff and aren't very good. Yeah, and yeah. it's like there's a there's a place in the middle where it's like you work your ass off, you make yourself undeniable, and you learn how to hold a conversation with somebody after a show and like put yourself out there in a way, you know? Part of it, both of those things, neither of those things are bad. Both of those things are good. And, and neither of those things are necessarily bad. It's just in excess, they're both destructive. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. one the LA pageant, I call it the pageant culture. I think my <laughs> personality good, was n- not, I wasn't aware I shouldn't be in LA I, when I was in my early 20s and I moved here. I wasn't aware I shouldn't, this wasn't the city for me. Um, and my personality wasn't going to be part of that high school prom homecoming pageant court that is LA. So some of that was my rebellion. Like, yeah, fuck that. I mean, you know, and I was in black clubs. So the black clubs were paying me money. And so it was my ego. I was like, yeah. well, I can play these black clubs. I'm getting funnier. People are inviting me to perform. Why would I go hang out at, you know, with these comedians and, some of that was good, but to a level, like by t- 2010 or 11, I should have been. After the Cat Williams, I wrote for Cat. After that, money ran out. I should have been going up to the fucking comedy store. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and supplicating a little bit. And, and I, you know, I knew people who I was friends with. I could have schmoozed a little anyway. Better late than never. That's, um, that's the phrase I've been saying to myself <laughs> a lot lately. It's, uh, I remember listening to Bill Burr talk about doing black rooms and getting addicted to it. And being like, it's you're kind of like the mascot for the white race. You're like, hey, look, once once your first Joe crushes, they're like, oh no, this guy's really good. I remember because I, I looked, I lived in Harlem for seven years, and I used to do uh, a couple shows up there, and I would be the only white comic, and it was like, it really was that feeling of like you could feel the room turn where you're like, oh no, we we do like this guy, and once that happened. It was so. It was like the best fucking room to do. I would look forward to it. I would get on their all star show every month. Like I wasn't getting that anywhere else in New York. Like that kind of love or feedback from an audience. So it's like, yeah, like I hear you. It's like you weren't a phony white guy, and that's all it kind of takes. Yes, it's yeah. just that that the first of all, there's somebody white who took the risk to come here. Yes, the audience is respecting that, which is amazing about black folks that they do respect that to begin with. And then he's not pretending to be like us, which was a, through the 90s, was a whole trope of white comedians pretending to be black. And when I came in, I was one of the few white, com- Roger Rod, there were a few other white comics out, out here. I don't know about the East Coast, but um, they like angry white comics. They like, like, like angry, especially angry white, uh, if, it's, if it's authentic and they don't think yeah. you're a trust fund person and you're not, you know, yeah. You can blow it up. I remember a, a friend of mine gave me advice, and this is like this is like back when I was doing open mics in New York. I would have been like 25, 26, and he was like, "Your anger doesn't make sense for a guy in his mid twenties, but like if you just don't quit comedy by the time you're forty, it it will make sense. So like you just you just don't match like how you look and how you feel isn't uh, profound. Did you did you yeah. know that? Did that make you angry? Or of course did you, it made me. I was like, "Fuck uh, you, dude!" Like I'm yeah, doing yeah. well. Like, but imagine what Mark Maron was like in his early twenties. Probably insufferable. Yeah. <laughs> probably insufferably bad yeah. and pretentious. And you would have been like, "What the fuck is this asshole?" But yeah, he got older, and it was the same thing. I have a video of myself. You're absolutely right. Chris uh, was it Chris Spencer who said to me. Why are you so angry? Because I looked like a kid who, like Jewish kid who, like my teeth were straight and yeah. I, I didn't look like I was living in my car. You know, I didn't look like I was living in my car. Um, and it pissed me off that he said that. But I was like 26. So I shouldn't have been. I, there's a video of me at the Bay Area Black Comedy Festival on YouTube. I look like I'm 17 and I'm doing like social commentary. And it's weird. Looking at it now, it's weird. when I got the tape, I was like, oh, I made it. I this, yeah, yeah. I finally have a tape, but then looking back on it, it's it's weird. Do you ever wonder? I mean, are you like a are you like a therapy guy? Like, how do you do you meditate? What do you do now with like the the anger that you have? Like, are you just funneling it onto stage, or what do you what do you use it for? Watching violent pornography. All right, there we go. All right, <laughs> we're get we're getting real. 
Uh, I, I was meditating. I should have done more of that. I should do, I should be doing more of that because that is really good. And there are times where the, the, the depression and sadness and of this past year and a half has been so heavy that I have just started deep breathing. And then the deep breathing, it, it reminds me, oh yeah, this is what, like after two or three big, good, deep breath breaths, yeah. I'm like, ever, the weight is gone. And I'm like, I could just do that. It's but the cloud. It's so much the cloud easier of to your just... anger. You like, you get out of it and you watch it pass. It's and... not just anger. Loneliness to boredom. Boredom is another one. Being bored, um, you know, because of being in Playa with no car and you're kind of trapped in your hovel or your, you know, where, where I live. Um, boredom, anger, sadness, loneliness, uh, the, the social media depression where everybody is showing what they're doing. And I'm like, hey, why am I not, why am I not on that show that yeah. five people who I'm funnier than are booked on, <laughs> right? Uh, Person never had that experience that you're describing. Yeah. It sounds like it would be terrible. Oh, man. That's <laughs> a funny aside about that. I could tell you a quick, quick story. of. I know everybody has that, so I try to sublimate it that way. Because with that, I'm like, oh, everybody's doing that. That's why everybody's showing the shit because every, no, and nobody's satisfied and everybody's depressed. So I, I can sublimate that a little bit. But yeah, yeah I, I, med, I do do deep breathing and um, it would be really nice to get a girlfriend. That would be amazing. Yeah, well, let's fucking do it, man. Let's, let's Thanks, podcast. Man. I'll send out the bat signal. <laughs> let's fucking make it happen for you, dude. Oh, man. You know, I went out just to hang out at a, because I was so, I had such a good time last week. With, oh, with and, uh, you guys yeah, after yeah. our show. And we had so much fun. My, my roommate came and uh, we had so much fucking fun that whole weekend. Because then the next night we had friends over and we partied and drank, got high. And uh, we came back. I called her up. I go, hey, can we just drop in? We just want to hang out. I just want to come and be, you know, because I feel like I had so much fun. At, I don't want to sit home on the Saturday. And I walked in and she asked me, um, Kelly, she goes, why are you not booked somewhere tonight? What are you doing here? Why are you not booked somewhere? And I said, um, I don't, I, I didn't have an answer for her. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not, nobody, you know, and she goes, this, this is not right with the universe. So that, that she's great. I mean, I, I met her. New three, York? No, mm-hmm. I met her three weeks ago. Like she, that whole uh, Broadway Comedy Club West situation was crazy to me it was uh, the guy daniel sent me a text or a message on instagram being like come audition for my club today but he knew you from new york no no? i'd never met him but you played the broadway comedy i played broadway comedy club years ago when i lived in new york and he must have had my name on some list of comics who'd moved to comics who'd moved to la that's got to be what it was so he asked me to come audition i did he whatever gave me put me on their first year past list and then, yeah, I met Kelly that night, the night that I met you. So I did too. Yeah. I mean, and I, but like, I, since then I've been talking with her, I started sending her veils and I'm like, oh, she's like the sweetest. She gets it, man. Yeah, yeah. She really knows what she's doing. What's so, it's, it's so crazy how much people who just respect comics time and are like kind stand out. You're like, like when you have that experience with the club, where so you're, like, rare. you're like, oh my God, they thanked me for coming. They were they happy. They paid me. They paid me. They were happy. Every time I get paid doing comedy, I'm like, this seems like a mistake. Or like, what, what, what has happened? Is, is the person in charge doing drugs? How, how has money found its way to me? But like, even, even the payment, that part's great. And I love that. But you, you, you know, and every comic knows, like we would do it without getting paid, and we did for many years. Well, wait a minute. I mean, if you, you're, you, you're new in L.A., yeah. nobody gets paid. I mean, if you get a, if you get a regular O.R. spot at the comedy store, you get twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. The same amount you got to probably perform at the Broadway Comedy Club, which just opened. If any other clubs, and let me put it to you this way: for those of you listening outside of comedy or whatever, or outside of L.A. There's another comedy club on the west side, not too far from the comedy club we played. And that comedy club has like the um, the hip kids, the Comedy Central people, you know, the people who are have agents. They don't pay anybody. And it's that's the hype. That's the profile club. But I can go to the Broadway Comedy Club and get paid pretty decently to close the show. And I have to leave my area code. And I don't give a fuck about the Comedy Central people, dude. I just want to have that. Yeah, yeah. And I can work out. And then the, per- the people love you. 
and they love you, you know, and and they're like they totally get it. And maybe they're it's because they're New York people. I don't know. I it feels different for sure. I mean, like I said, I've only done the one show there, but I was like, oh, I hope this continues to be a thing. This is like a nice. This just felt like a nice little oasis from, especially, I mean, obviously from not doing stand-up at all for 17 months. Um, it felt nice to get back into it that way. Was that your first set? Yeah. No. So I did, I did a comedy festival in Akron in May, which was like, right, it was like I got, you know, my wife's immunocompromised, so we were like super careful or whatever. And then once we got the vaccine, it was like you had to wait two weeks out, I guess, until it was in your blood. And uh, my two weeks out was the start of this comedy festival that I literally applied to in like the beginning of 2019 and forgot was even a thing. And then they emailed last minute, like, okay, we're actually going to go ahead and do it. And I was like, Oh fuck, I'll fucking fly out, go out there, did like eight shows in seven days, book stuff all around the Akron Cleveland area and was getting amped. Like, you know, it's Cleveland. Nobody's wearing a fucking mask. Like there's just orgies happening everywhere. I'm like, this fucking rocks. Like it's over, baby. It's over. And then I came back to L.A. like, all right, time to book some more shows. And it was people here were like, not fucking having it. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. And even now, like, it's like, I don't know. It feels like every time we get, like, we're going to be well, like, more past it. Two, one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, I had, I've had comedy shows booked that got canceled because the tickets didn't sell. Yeah. And I've seen other yeah. comics put stuff up from other rooms where they said this show's canceled. So... You know, people want to do it, but if they can't sell enough tickets, then... And our show, actually, uh, Friday night, was there was supposed to be a Friday night and a Saturday late show, right? At our, yeah, yeah. And, they canceled uh, and they canceled the right. one that we weren't, thank God. Yeah, so, um, you know, it is what it is, but it, just to get paid and not have to leave my area code and have people think I'm great... It's, it's, a, Dude, bless, it's a blessing. It's manna I, from heaven. I booked you... On my podcast, because I was like, you crushed. And you were, I don't even think you thought you crushed so hard when you were on stage. You were like, ah, still working it out. But I was like, this dude's fucking annihilating the room right now. It was oh, like, thanks, man. They Thank also, you, man. It was, yeah, like I respect that when I see somebody doing that on stage. I'm like, I definitely want to fucking pick that guy's brain a little bit more. Cause it was, I mean, I thought it was impressive. I appreciate that. Stood out. That was me. third gear. I'm in third, I haven't gotten out of third gear. That's third gear for me. When I get in the fifth gear, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to do the bit, you know, the, the, the closer and the, you know, and I'm relying a lot on that. The audience, first of all, was really good. They were laughing at stuff and I didn't, uh, Oh, what, how did my roommate put it? I got, I got, a, when you have a gear shift, like a shift, you miss a shift. Yeah, I yeah. missed a shift. And, uh, what I should have done was stayed in the gear I was in and kept going with the rant I was on with Eddie Murphy. And uh, I know exactly, like, I'm analyzing the set <laughs> and go on. With it. Instead, I got cute. I got cute. I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna do a little triple Lindy here and do land this yeah. thing. And, and you it, got the twisties. It got a little weird, but yeah, then, but I, <laughs> then I, you know, pulled it back. But, you know, I, but I, I'm still in my mind, I'm, I can go into fifth gear. But in what, what I can do now is not. I'm, I'm third is good, and maybe I could have gone into fourth. Yeah, yeah. You know? But, uh, yeah, but that crowd was good for the fact that they weren't drinking because that's another thing. They're done, they don't have a liquor license there. And I the think fact, they're getting one, though, right? Didn't they say, like, the following week? They oh, had okay, because they had alcohol. They did. Yeah. They had beer and wine. It was definitely an opening show. Yeah. Yeah. And that, the, the host also wasn't – this is the other thing. I've been, been, haven't been doing this a long time and being in black rooms. It's really important to have a host – or it's not important. It can really be helpful <laughs> to have a host who up front doesn't do their set. They, they warm up the crowd. Yes. And yeah. um, I know the woman who hosted who's very funny, very, very funny. She does a one-woman show and everything. However, um, you know, a host should do crowd work and make everybody feel cozy and familiar. Yeah. That's actually like a trick of a host. And a lot of comics don't want a host because they don't want to do that. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's why good hosts have a lot of jobs. Because they do. It's, it's a and then Corey Mosley, the girl who showed up, uh, yeah, yeah. My, my friend, uh, she ended up hosting on Friday night for them. And she did a great job because that's what she does. She's a host. You know, she yeah. makes everybody feel good. So th- they didn't really have that that night. So the comics from a guy who's been doing this so long, I could see. 
the comics. Every comic was dealing with like a, a little bit more of an uphill thing because the crowd wasn't really warm. They didn't feel warm. And um, yeah, that, that would be my observation about that. Yeah, that's no, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. And I had that thought. And that again, that was like the, the a comic ego. I'm like, I'm going to get them. Like before I go up, I'm like, I'm going to be the one that really breaks this show fucking open. And I get up there, I'm like, ugh, oh, all you right. You took some swings, though. Took some swings. You know, it was what it was. And then... You made fun of the room. Yes. You made fun of the situation yeah. and the room. And the crowd probably didn't reward you as as for as funny as it was, in my opinion. Well, that's what you said. Yeah, that's what you said to me, and I appreciated that. But then you came up and were like, I'm just going to hit five grand slams here. And I was like, <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time, dude. I've been <laughs> I doing like, this a long time. I, I and also, I got to watch you guys all swing and miss at the things I was going to say. Yeah. I was going to go up and say, well, you know, welcome to Comedy Night at California Pizza Kitchen. <laughs> and you kind of did that. I mean, you did your own version of that. But, yeah, yeah. you know, um, I was going to uh, give a big round of applause for the acoustics in here. Because <laughs> the fucking acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't but, turn off the lights until halfway through the show. So that I was, oh right, they didn't turn off the yeah, lights. Yeah, but that was the thing where I'm like, I got to get more experience in comedy world because I noticed that. And when I come, when I came on stage, I should have said, "Turn off the lights." Because I remember it, it's so funny. I did improv for years in New York and got really good at improv. We can talk about the decision to do that. You know, that was obviously a uh, <laughs> regrettable mistake. The thing I'm most ashamed of. But I I would get comfortable in improv to do things like that where I was like you're just on a different level when you're performing where you're like you feel comfortable maybe stepping out in a way that even in stand-up I'm like if I tell them to turn off the lights are they not going to want to have me back like is that going too far but like like I said other people who have been done have done it longer who know what it is go like just fucking turn off those lights what are we doing in here yeah. you would you would just do the thing no, no. without thinking about you're, it. You're not. You're 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 right. <clears throat> you're right. And when I did a sh I did this show with the Dynasty Typewriter, which is the big hip comedy room, which I'd never been in. And when I got there, I was second on the list, and it was a mic handoff. And I, I, you know, I'm on the show with Dana Gould and Eddie, and it's Eddie's show, Eddie Peptone and Friends, and Dana Gould is the first comic, and then me, and then a couple of female comics, and then um, his road opener JT and then Eddie and I had I knew right away this is not gonna go well I knew I was like well maybe there's a chance they'll be with me and they'll be good but I was like I should not be the second thing people see but all, I didn't have the I didn't have the balls to say you know <laughs> to Eddie hey yeah. dude can you put me in a different spot on the show yeah I didn't have the 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 fortitude I didn't have the you know so it, we all do that. I just did it in a different scenario. Sure, yeah. you, you, you were with the broad, with me with Broadway. If I had been first up, <laughs> I would have gone to the guy and gone, you know, um, yeah, you might want to put me a little later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah, that, that, that makes me feel better to know that you also failed. I got to say that makes me really, that does fill me with Horribly. A, a joy in front of Chris Rock's agent, <laughs> Chris Rock's agent was there. Thank God he, he already likes me. Um, and he left after my set. So he didn't see the comics go on after me have good sets, That's, that's which was great. Nice and um, who else did I fail in front of the former booker of the improv? I fell, failed in front of Eddie's personal booker who is a great, brilliant guy uh, I, I failed I failed in front of a lot of people who could have if I'd crushed, if I'd done my if Lenny Bruce had flown, it would have been yeah. an amazing thing. And uh, there is and I think people who are real eyes for talent or just people who are great comics who know great comedy enjoy watching good comics bomb. Like I like I know I do. Like that there is something to like watching how people handle that. When you know they're good and you can tell that their material's there and that their stage presence there and the audience sucks and there's nothing that anybody could do to get them, it's uh, it to me it's like I that's the stand up I, I either enjoy the best stand up or really good stand up with terrible audiences I feel like are my two favorite ones to watch. Here's a an interesting I have a question I have for you: Have you ever had a set where you were bombing? I don't know if I put this correctly. So you were in such a good mood that it you actually like 
it didn't affect you on stage and you were able to like just laugh through it and enjoy it. Has that ever happened to you? Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. And it happened uh, because I host a show for, I hosted a weekly show in LA for two years before the pandemic. Like it was, we're doing it in New York for years. I moved here. I got two of my friends out here to like help produce it with me. And most of the shows are bad because none of us are famous and it's a weekly show. So it's like bad just by virtue of there's eight people in the audience this week. And my, st- you know, whatever, my general vibe is not like alt comic and like. Oh, it was I, an alty kind of. It was an alty kind of black box room that we could find that we could afford to do a weekly show. It just wasn't a perfect fit for, I think, what we, I want to have a show in a club, which is what we're going to do starting in October. So. I had a ton of bad shows like that. But the other thing that was happening in my life, like in the last two years, was my wife doing really well out here. I got on America's Got Talent at one point. Like I had some cool stuff happening for me where I was coming to the show being in a really good mood. Being like, how many people are here? Oh, three fucking people? Let's fucking party. And just getting on stage and it's like a a Russian KGB agent and like a couple that hates each other and just being like, fuck it. Because there was no pressure. There's no you. pressure. And it's like, right. so yeah, I would say like that, it was it was actually pretty a good muscle to be like, I can't remember where I heard this. I don't want, I'm not taking credit for coming up with this idea, but it's whatever you're, I remember when I was starting comedy, I was like, I'm going to be this type of, I'm going to be this type of comic. I'm going to be a. A, a bad guy. I'm a bad boy comic. But the truth is, is like if you're in a silly mood when you come on stage, you should just be a silly comic for that night. Like whatever mood you're feeling, that's your performance. And I think I think this last two years leading up to the pandemic of doing my weekly, usually not well attended show was like a good reminder of that, of like, if I'm in a great mood, I'm going to be in a great mood. I'm not going to let this affect me. And also, if I'm in a bad mood, I'll be in a bad mood on stage. Right, but you're developing other aspects of your personality that you can, whether it's conscious or not, because sometimes we don't consciously know, hey, that's kind of a fun thing to do, and I haven't really explored that. Maybe I can work that into my my beats, my the music I'm playing. Maybe I can play those notes somehow. Yeah. You know, um, no notes are off no notes are wrong if you can figure out where to play them in the song, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you have all these aspects to your personality. I have an aspect of my personality that's really goofy and bizarre and surreal. And I like surreal, bizarre, you know, uh, um, ironic shit. But um, I think I knew from a very young age that that angry part of me, that part of me, that part of me that I need to say what I mean, if I don't master that, that I won't have any glue to hold all this other shit together. I won't have any glue to hold the Rodney Dangerfield, Robin Williams, the Andy Kaufman, the Richard Pryor influences, unless I develop the George Carlin part, which is really who I am, which is somebody who needs to tell people what they think. (laughs) I literally literally just rewatched Life is Not Worth Living a couple days ago. And was like, oh, I, I Carlin, had, Carlin, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just, one of his his later ones, right? Later, yeah. I think he still did like four after that. Like he, that's you know, it was his last couple were not very good, but this one was like one of the good later ones. I would. It was say. the one with the tombstones in the yes. cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where he says it's called the American Dream because you got to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. I love yeah. And then there's the part where he's like. uh, uh they don't care about you at all, at all, at all, yeah. at all. And I was just, it was just like, fuck, it was like somebody punching me in the stomach. I'm like, God damn it. I'm, and I'm like a fucking, patri- like my dad was in the army, military brat. I'm like a patriotic dude. And he's like, the cemeteries are littered with the bodies of soldiers that died thinking God was on their side. I'm like, you motherfucker. But it's like, it's so fucking raw. Like it's, I don't think I had an appreciation for Carlin until I kind of found my ability to talk more honestly on stage because it used to like piss me off right i remember having debates with friends being like carlin fucking sucks he's overrated but it's because i didn't like i didn't like seeing him be that honest well also maybe you you didn't like him seeing him do something you couldn't do yet yeah oh for sure maybe not consciously um but i knew at 24 25 when i moved out here i knew I can do all these things. I have these clever wordplay. I've got this. I had I had like 20 minutes of material when I moved out here. I started very young, 
19. So by the time I got here at 25, I had featured on the road and opened for Mitch Hedberg. And not that that was a part of my development, but it's a credit, people. Okay? I'm throwing out a credit. <laughs> all right? That's all I'd really done. Um, Any of the ladies out there yeah. looking for a former Mitch Hedberg <laughs> opener? He's right here. Mitch Hedberg <laughs> brought me back out on stage one night. He goes, Steve, come out and sing a song for the crowd. He was so stoned, man. He was like, come, Steve. I, I actually did ecstasy. I broke a pill off and, and took half a fucking pill and, and rolled with Mitch Hedberg during the show. Holy and, shit. And that week, I, I, I bombed all week. I was the opener. Kenny Smith was the middle. It was the Birmingham Stardome. So it's like 500 people. And Kenny Smith was the feature and Mitch Hedberg. And I fucking bombed all week. The first show I did, I, I did good, but Hedberg wasn't there. He came Friday and Saturday. So that's like a Tuesday, the first show I had. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a great week. Then I bombed Wednesday. Then I bombed Thursday. And then Friday I bombed two shows. I just tanked out. Who gives a shit? You're the opening act, whatever. I mean, you care, but nobody else nobody really. Cares. It doesn't, the show isn't relying on you being and Saturday night, I took a half a pill with Mitch Hedberg, and I fucking just destroyed. <laughs> and I did my board game bit, which was in its infancy then. I had just, I had just been doing it just maybe a year or two. And I remember I came back in the, um, in the green room, and Mitch goes, <laughs> he goes, checkers, because one is black and one is red, right? Because checkers is if you're black and you make love to a Native American. And he goes, because one is black and one is red, right? He goes, I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. But uh, yeah, so when I came out here, I was like, oh, I got this wordplay and I'm kind of clever and cute. I was terrified to say anything personal. Terrified. I was terrified to expose anything about myself that was personal. I was like, I'm using this to get a part in something and someone will see me and think I have talent in you know, Hollywood, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and for, then, for our listeners, uh, this is an audio podcast. There was a, a masturbation jerk off <laughs> with accompanying the word Hollywood, just so the audience picks. I know, yeah. I don't know if that was meant just for me, but I wanted them to get the full. I had a perception. The jerk off is my, uh, my uh, metaphor you know, <laughs> for, I had a perception that I could impress people who might, you know, I could, I could fool people into helping me or whatever, whatever the mentality of sociopaths like <laughs> narcissists like us who come out for you know hollywood so uh but then i quickly kind of figured out that when i played a black club i was like I, I the first night i played a black club i was like you know maybe i might be able to be good at this like maybe i could be good at this and 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 it could be meaningful like maybe uh, and i thought well if i'm gonna be good at it i'm gonna have to master saying my, my opinion about shit and yeah. that would be the glue. I kind of knew intuitively that would be the glue that would allow me to go f to all these other places. You know, you said something before when you were talking about, like, the different parts of you and, like, how, like, being able to say your actual opinion ties all that stuff together. You can still be silly you and sad you and goofy you. Like, all those parts are, like, I literally have a thing with my wife, and I've talked about this in therapy where when we met I was fully into improv like I was doing that and improv Eric as we call him improv Eric was like this open like super liberal woke dude that was like I would teach these classes with students who had never done improv and I would get them to like express themselves on stage it was like a very artsy version of myself and I, lo and I loved it. Like, I'm, I'm not even hating on it. Like, my actual favorite memories from New York were mostly teaching people improv. Like, I, we would do these grad shows, these level one grad shows where they would get on stage for the first time. And, like, some of the hardest laughs I've ever had in my life. I remember, I mean, I've never said this on the podcast, I think, but one time I was teaching a class, and I guess they, like, use chairs, and like, chairs takes your energy down in improv. And I said, no more chairs. You guys are using chairs too much. Get rid of the chairs. And in my head, I'd been like, oh, well, at some point, I'll just let them use the chairs again. It's just like a little lesson for the first week of class. But I was a new teacher, so I just forgot. And I just never, for the whole class, they never had chairs on stage. They always had to move around or find some other way to justify being active. And so then, like, their grad show comes. It's a 100-person theater in New York at the pit. They sold it out. There's 16 of them on stage. The first two people walk out for their scene. Somebody goes, well, we should probably hop in the car and go get a drink. And they're like, okay, let's do it. And then they look confused for a second, and then they just sit down on the floor because I didn't even put – I just was like, fuck. I'm, I'm in the booth lighting them going, 
I never put the chairs back out. For eight weeks of class, they don't know how to go and just grab them from the sides. And I got this huge reaction from the audience, and I was like, that, that kind of shit of like, those are my favorite moments from being in New York. But then when I started doing stand-up, and I was like, I was like getting angry on stage. It was a very different version of me. And I'm like, God, it feels like, am I becoming like a worse person or something? Am I losing that silly version of myself? But I feel like, like I was telling you before, the act of getting good at stand-up has forced me to like say what I think on stage. And I feel like that improv version of myself has come back in my performances more recently in stand-up where I'm like a, a fuller version of myself because I'm still able to like do the most important thing on stage, which is say what I actually feel to an audience. Yeah, if you, I mean... The best, I think the best thing is to find a place where people will let you do, like you had the place with the three people or the eight people, yeah. where you could just do whatever you want, and uh, I don't think comics understand they want to go to the improv and be on featured on a show at the improv or the Laugh Factory, but to have a place where you where there's no pressure and you can kind of do what you want and learn... Um, you know, it's underrated. It's an underrated thing. I mean, even the comics who are out on Venice Beach performing on the street have yeah. a, an, a, a, or Brody Stevens famously was a, a tour guide in D.C. And that's where he said he told me he learned to talk the way he talks. And how, how did he develop this very bizarre stream of consciousness, very unique delivery? Well, it's because he talked. He, he got on and talked and he had a place where people were captive. They couldn't leave. Yeah, they were yeah. on a fucking tour bus or some shit and they couldn't get out, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so you got to have a place like that. I, I found uh, a place in Hollywood that I go <laughs> and it's clean, which is the funniest thing because I'm the furthest thing from a clean comic. And it, for, it forces me also to be use different language. Yeah. Not consciously, but I, I can do it. For 10 minutes, I can do it. And I go up, and I can do whatever I want, and people seem to love me there, and they let me kind of go. And also, the other comics are bad. That's nice. So That's I don't nice have thing. to worry about following, you know, or they're new. I shouldn't say they're bad. They're, a lot of them are new. Some of them are bad. Some of them are new. Some and of bad. them are bad and new. Some of them are old and bad. And they've been, and a couple are great. And Always then, the worst combo. It, <laughs> it's also, yeah, it's also on Fairfax, right, <laughs> right in the district of Melrose and Fairfax. So you get these weird people wandering in, you know, you just, it's a, it's an amalgamation of bizarre personalities and. Wait, on Melrose, I used to live off of Melrose and Fairfax. Well, I'm trying to think of what place that it's you're It's the Kibitz about. Room. Oh, and yeah. And I go there on Tuesdays and they. You know, they have they get sign up so they have open mic comics come in. But they let me go on whenever I want and do time as long as I'm clean, relatively clean. Yeah. And I've been doing that for like three years and that's been like life support. Of course is they that just Nicole's show? No, I did her show too. Okay. That's a Monday night. Uh, that was horrible, actually. That was a horrible show. <laughs> N Nicole, uh, avid listener of the podcast. Sorry to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. She's great. She she's great. really cool. But that show was... And it was packed. So it was full. Like, people were there. So the Tuesday yeah. night, for some reason, is... Uh, I don't know. The energy in there just likes me. And uh, I can go on it. And, and I never do the same set. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll say the same thing I said. But, you know, sometimes I'll just do, do 10 minutes on what was happening in the room. You know, something happened in the room that was genuinely funny. Um, at one time, I went up and I made fun of the room, the shape of the room. I, I described it as like a, I did a I whole have, description uh, of the room as like a, uh, like a, like a, I don't even know what I said. I can't, I should have really, I should record these things because it was really funny. Um, Jewish, because it's the kibitz room at Cantor's. Oh, I did think about Jackie Mason last week. So I just, whatever, whatever's on my mind, I go. And that really is helpful. Yeah. Um, it's an easy room to make fun of shape-wise because they got that, there's that booth right by the stage where somebody's back is to you. And it's like, it's a lot of rooms where like the first thing you see is the back of someone's head eating a fucking yeah. corned beef sandwich. Yeah. You're like, all right, this is a, yeah, I know a, what I'm in for. It's also funny that they're the rules, they'll get up and read the rules. If the guy who runs it is so funny. He's a a former owner of the Improv Comedy Traffic School, and uh, he'll go up and read the rules off. Like, he looks like Alan Arkin. You know, he's like yeah, yeah. with the bald Jewish guy, you know, with, okay, rule number one, 
you can't, you know, be too loud in here. You know, like, so we go no graphic bodily fluids humor. You know, and it'll go through the list. I don't find for me it's like it's the hard part of clean comedy is not cursing. It's the topics. Like that's like I've done a couple clean shows where I'm like, I guess I'm just gonna talk about my dog. I can talk about my dog and my dad. And not even half the stuff I talk about my dad on stage. Like, it's, like, so hard to stay out of, like, the fucking... You, you got gritty subject matter. That exactly. You... That's that's the hard part for me. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So I got... you find some lighthearted part of yourself, like the dog and your dad. I, got, I have to... There's other lighthearted things that you, that, you know, you just... I don't know what to tell you. I, all I know is I have been doing this for 25 years. You start to get... Like, oh, I'll talk about the plant on the wall or I'll talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but it has to be something that I do find funny. Like there's some tension in the room or the comics who went on before me. Sometimes I'll just, I'll just do commentary on their sets. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like They're that. They're just in the back. They like, don't like oh that. Oh my God. One guy came on and he was a, he was six, four. So there was a guy who went on and he was like a Jewish guy like me, five, 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 six. He looked like he was raised in a, in an incubator. He looked like he was raised in like a veal. In no light, you know, he just looked like a, you know, like a, oh, I love Patton Oswalt. And then, and then <laughs> my comedy and then, sounds just yeah, like him. Oh. I love Patton Oswalt. And then the guy came on after him and he was like six, four with long hair and a tight shirt and like, you know, the, 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 the clutch, like the leather thing that guys wear with a snap, like to yeah, make yeah, themselves yeah. feel like Game of Thrones or something. And he kind of, he tatted up and he, he didn't do very well. And uh, neither, no one was doing well. And called, I, I came Carl and Drago I did, didn't do very well? Fought, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was like a metrosexual Carl Drago. He was like a Carl Drago or whatever, the Jason Momoa. <laughs> yeah. This guy was like a thinner version. I go, dude, I came up, I go, look, let me tell you something. You're not, you're supposed to be singing. Like, <laughs> you, what are you doing here? Just sing. You don't have, write poetry. Nobody understands. You don't have to be understood intellectually in life. You, and I just ranted about him. Just not, what are you doing? You're not a comedian. You are a singer, a musician. Jim Morrison, you're Jim Morrison, dude. You don't have to be good at anything. You just look cool and be drunk or stoned. And yeah, yeah, yeah. look, look at the guy who went on before. You see that guy, the Paul Simon looking guy? That's a comedian. <laughs> That's a, You are not a comedian. And I just, five minutes of that. And people were rolling and, you know, and, and it gives you confidence to do that. Because you're like, wow, I could like, I created something. Completely spontaneous, yeah, yeah. and they liked it, and they dug it. You know, it's a those free moments on stage are the best. It's 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 it's, it's you know, as a comedian, it's like yeah, you got to like develop your material so you have material, and that's important to have. But like on a like just a purely like how you feel when you're performing, those off the cuff moments that the audience knows something happened in the moment. They know you don't have something pre-written for it, and you get to find it with them. Is the fucking Dave Chappelle? I really believe is one of the people who is living the dream of under. He has that fame where everybody's paying attention, but he also knows how to use it. He knows. He knows what he's. He knows how to have fun and not take it seriously and. He also has all the resources and the fame and all that great stuff. Yeah. But like a lot of comedians, you see like, uh, you know, Tiffany Haddish, Kevin Hart, Amy Schumer, they feel pressure to, to constantly be cranking out specials and they got a machine and there's a, there's a machine behind them. And you feel like that's not, there's some, I, I feel, I shouldn't say you, I feel like they're, they're going to put out a comedy special even if it's substandard because they're maybe not at the, the level where, they understand, I can just do whatever I want now. Why don't I just have fun and yeah. just goof around with this? And and I think Burr does understand that, like Bill Burr. He kind of gets it. Dave Chappelle kind of, you can you can tell, kind of understands that. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway. You, you don't have to pay the business back immediately. It's like, I know, we know that we know they plucked you. But they've but they fucked up. They gave you money. Now it's yours. Like once the money hits your bank account, it's yours to do with as you wish. You don't owe it back right away. And I think that I think it's a lot of people. It's it's a human thing. But it's like you don't. You just get used to a certain standard of living and a certain level of prestige. And to be able to step back from that is hard. I mean, it's 
Obviously, Chappelle's the greatest example of like, I'm going to fucking leave my show, the most popular show on, I'm going to fucking stop doing it for a reason that I feel is important to me and basically destroy my career, which is what he did. I mean, he did, it didn't end up that way, but you, if in interviews, he, he that's, how, that's how he describes what well, he did in the moment. I heard him say, my phone st- wasn't ringing as much as it was ringing before. Yeah. But that's in his head. His fame actually got more legendary. It did. By doing that. Of course. And look, as comics, we love it, but I'm saying the strength to do that in that moment where things are going your way, where you've worked hard to get them going your way and say... Yeah, throw the brakes on this. I'm not feeling right about it. I think a lot of people, and it's not just comics. No, I think it's it, people in a lot of different ways in life would be like, I work too hard to get the train moving. Right. To switch now. Right. And like, that's a, that's a real, like, that's what a fucking artist does. It's like they put themselves in a hole on well, purpose. Remember, you remember Bob Dylan decided <laughs> he went electric? That was a that was a moment like oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Um, where he was basically telling his uh, audience he thought they were pretentious assholes, mm-hmm. and basically telling them that. I mean, in his own poetic way, uh, a comedian can't quite get away with that, maybe. But uh, but then he became a Christian, and he he never cared. He knew you know he was going to do what he was going to do. When you have that fame, I don't see why it's that. For me, my personality, if I have that those resources, I would have no problem with that. Well, you, but we wouldn't because we've never had the resources, and we've been, yeah, we, we we've been know. plugging away. We don't know what, what that temptation right. feels like. It's the, uh, I mean, the truth is, is yeah, like those people that get, even people who work hard and earn their break, and I, all those people we've talked about did work hard. Sure, there's still that level of like, they're still young-ish when it happened, and like that is. I think about the shit that I did when I was 27, 28 years old. Like, I was still a fucking idiot. Like, it's not that far in the rearview mirror for me. But, like, if I had had a bunch of fucking money and people, like, asking me for stuff and owing things back to the business, I can't say that I wouldn't have been, like, Bieber, done some crazy shit, or been doing PSAs telling people who to vote for. And, like, I, yeah, I got comedy, <laughs> but there's a lot of call to actions in there, too, all right? This is – my comedy punches up under penalty of death. Like, all that shit – that I think people do because they feel like, well, now I have this platform. I'm, I, <laughs> it's, uh, it's feeling like you owe it back and not realizing like once they pay you and it's them, it's not we, it's them. Once they pay you, that money's yours to go be an artist. Like yeah. go do some shit for yourself. But I think people struggle to step away from it. It's like the fucking siren song right from those ladies that tried to get that dude to sail a oh, ship into the, the rocks uh, oh, oh brother where art thou or oh, i'm thinking of the 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 odyssey but i can't oh it I, is I, they're I, the same thing okay they, great they yeah, the odyssey. Yeah, yeah right right i'm too dumb to remember the no, names it's okay of the characters, okay it was you, the you were with me you were with me <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's why you need like a friend to tie you to the mast of the ship so you can still hear the song which sail it fucking past you need somebody from your life to be like, you don't need to do a fucking Sprite commercial. You don't need the money. You don't need to high five right. Barack Obama at right. a fucking p- political rally. But Just people be a- are telling you pe- like, so you have this infrastructure around you and these people who are re- suddenly reliant on your income and your, and your buzz telling you, you need to host this award show. Yeah. You need to do this commercial. You need to do, you know, we need to keep this thing going. And I'm, I'm just not that I wouldn't been that, probably the reason I haven't been more successful is because my personality was not like that to begin with. If I had been, I might have had s- sooner success because I had breaks and help, you know, uh, along the way I met the right people and I could have done that. But, um, yeah, but, but I, 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 my stubbornness would have never allowed that to happen. I would have been like, I, what are you kidding me? And Cat Williams asked me to buy him a vaporizer. He asked me to buy him a vaporizer. I was like, you hired me as a writer. What, what are you doing, dude? Go buy the guy a fucking vaporizer. And there was that little voice. And then I went, okay, man, I'll buy you a vaporizer. And, and then you know what? In his next special, my white friends introduced me to the vaporizer. <laughs> you know, get out of your own way, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, like go. <laughs> so it's not like one is the answer and the other one is not. It's like there, there's a balance there. And uh, I just appreciate Chappelle because I, he's not even my favorite con, but I appreciate 
that part of it that I watch him and I go, he understands how to use this. Yeah. He understands how, what to do with this. And, um, yeah, man, and I don't know how we got off on that tangent, but I don't know either. We're at time and we barely, I don't even think we talked about Caleb Haney, <laughs> which we should. I'm so thankful. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about that 2010 championship game. Oh, you're a Bears fan. Look, look yeah, you're a Bears fan. Let, oh, man. I don't think he played that bad. One one touchdown, two picks? No, he didn't play that bad, but they had a championship defense, and we just didn't have a quarterback. I like Caleb Haney going. Uh, I, I I read an article where he was like, I'm not just going to be some fucking game manager. Like, he was like, he's getting pretty ballsy. But he had a pimp, he had a pimp attitude. That's what you got to have, but hell yeah. But, <laughs> look, my... Dude, my- dude, that was Aaron Rodgers coming out. That 2010, that was the year he won. Yep. The only time he's won. That was our chance to get a, a co- one good coffin nail in him before he was going to go on this brutal beatdown of a decade that we've gone through as Bear fans. Yeah. With this guy who, by the way, and, I, and I'm not a uh, Green Bay lover, and I will just tell you straight out, is probably the greatest quarterback I've ever seen play the, the game of football. Caleb Haney? <laughs> 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 Oh, and then we had the incredible shrinking man, Jay Cutler, on the other side, who was like, just watch him play that game. Watch him play. Like, he's like just a shriveled up, like a like a scrotal, a piece of a scrotal. Do you, how much of what you feel for Jay Cutler boils down to how his face looks? Because he's got a, some people have a face. They just have a face. I can answer that. So it's got to be some of it. It's some of the fucking If Jay equation. Cutler played like Deshaun Watson or Aaron Rodgers, I wouldn't give a fuck. I'd have a picture of him on my wall, <laughs> and I would salute him every morning. <laughs> I don't care what the dude's face looks like. If he could play, if he wasn't checked out mentally or whatever was going on, that would have been remembered as one of the greatest defenses right up there with the 85 Bears. Yeah, yeah. And they probably would have won multiple Super Bowls. Because remember, we were in 06. We had this... We had this half a decade of superstar defenses in Chicago, and we just, no one will, it's going to be lost in the, in the wind, man. I did Rex Grossman on this episode. He's one of my, he was one of my guys that I talked about. And uh, it was crazy because, like, he actually did have some really solid games that season, but it was all in the beginning. He was just a hot and cold quarterback, and unfortunately he got cold in the playoffs. He was, it's him, Cutler, um, uh, Orton. Tr- Trubisky. Orton was a solid, mediocre yeah. quarter. He was a solid quarter, but they he he couldn't give us the big plays like Grossman. Grossman yeah. could throw the deep ball. That was the difference. Because remember, the Bears were, were eleven and five the year before with with Orton, and then Grossman came back from multiple injuries, and then he played no six, and we were thirteen, and you know we were great. We were great, and uh, yeah, of course the Bears win that fucking Super Bowl if they've got a quarterback. If they've yeah. got you know. If they have a Drew Brees, maybe we win five or six. You know, maybe look, maybe Justin Fields is the uh, is the. What guy do you for think you. about that? How do you? I, f- I like him, man. I like the fact that there wouldn't have been football in the Big Ten if it wasn't for him last year. Like really? He, oh yeah, because they were uh, they were like COVID fearful, which I guess is fair. But like they were kind of trying to muscle all the other Power Five to just not have a college football season, and it was Justin Fields that got a bunch of players and coaches together to be like. We want to play. Like, the, these university presidents pussing out is not reflective of what the majority of the team wants to play, uh, what the majority of the team thinks and what the coaches think. So he started this, like, kind of movement in the Big Ten for people to start speaking out against the, I would argue, overbearing COVID policies and protections. And then they had a season. So a lot, a lot of college football last year is due to Justin Fields. I like him. I, everything about him I like. My only concern is that I keep thinking of Robert Griffin III and how hot he was coming out of college and how yeah. the Redskins kind of misused him. And they let him not even be put in harm's way, but he kind of, they let him play hurt. Yeah, yeah. And he never recovered. And so I just wonder if Chicago really needs to be really, we had a, we had one of the best drafts of any draft ever. We got Tevin Jenkins in the second round. So we got a starting left tackle. 
but they got to go. They got to go all in and hard on that offensive line in the next couple drafts because they got to protect this guy. It's the same thing with any rookie quarterback. It's like just build the offense. Like th- let the defense suck for his first five years. The defense but, is already good though. They, yeah. they're good, good, we have well, good even better. Even better. Right. So like Fields is is Fields is in a much better situation than Trevor Lawrence, who's going to Jacksonville. Who's got he's going to be playing with the the the, the D leaguers, you know? Yeah, he'll have, but he has Tebow to lean on, man. That's all he needs. Tebow? Oh, is his backup? Tebow is the backup. He's like the fourth string tight end in Jacksonville. Do you know that? You know that motherfucker should have just come out of college and been a tight end. <laughs> of course, what was he, he doing? Dude, that's what everybody was saying. But he was like, but he, he led the Denver Broncos to the playoffs as a quarterback. Amen. That confused a lot of people, man. This is what I would have done if I was a GM and I had a fan base being like, uh, "Why aren't you playing Tebow?" I'd be like, "You know what? Fuck it. Five year contract, and we won't even have a backup quarterback. We'll just go zero and sixteen, and I'll prove to you how bad he is." I would be like a, I would be like a reactive vindictive general manager that would get fired right away because that, that that's what it is is like they knew he was bad they knew that they were but they won they won i agree i agree he they led won. them you know but like i think the right move it's it's you can't do it because everybody's trying to preserve their job it's the same reason they got rid of Foles and kept Wentz because they were like well look long term everything tells us that carson wentz is going to be better than nick Foles. they could have won another super bowl the competitive like the competitive nature, the competitive person that plays sports goes, we're winning, we get to keep playing, and somebody has to beat us before we leave the field. Right. That's like that's just how well, I feel. Well, that's the about old it. days. That's the oh, old that, days. That's of in sports. the fucking rear. Yeah. View now it's mirror. all futures and uh, and projecting what's going to be a decade from now and being a little too smart for your own good. These executives oh, dude, and shit. Music to my ears right now, dude. I mean, it's like, did you see Moneyball? I didn't see Moneyball. Okay, so you should watch Moneyball. I, I know about the book. Well, well, yeah. Well, Moneyball is like fat Jonah Hill being like, I have noticed that these types of players will do better <laughs> with the money we have. And it's like, it's cool because at the time you're like, oh, wow, they're really swimming into unknown waters here. Like that, that is a cool thing for an organization that has no options because their payroll is fucking a tenth of everybody else. Oh, right, right. Yeah, like the A's have no money. Right. So that's the whole point of that movie. But it's what's lost when people talk about how brilliant it is is that they had no other option. Their only option was to just sift through other people's shit and find a different way. Now it feels like all sports is just fucking nerds talking about sports Be- and making decisions, but they don't, they're not players. They think that that's what's happening now. But I think it's kind of like any experiment people are going to figure out, especially with sports where you can see the results of stuff. People are going to figure out that's not the end all be all. Cause look at the Tampa Bay Rays. No, no payroll. Right. Yeah. And they're competing with the Red Sox and the Yankees every year. Still this year. I mean, I think they have one of the best. Uh, and when they hired Kevin Cash, they said it was cause they, they didn't want to pay a manager. But this guy's one of the best managers in baseball. So and it wasn't a baseball player either. Yeah, he was. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking of the. I'm thinking of somebody else. You're yeah, right. but he was wasn't a, a good that. baseball player. He was a terrible baseball player. <laughs> so, which you know, whatever. But um, but anyway, what look what the Cubs just did. The Cubs just, oh god, the Cubs just unloaded all of our stars. They traded all our stars away. Every six, seven good Jack Peterson, Kimbrel, Tapera, Chafin. Baez, Rizzo, Bryant, all gone in a matter of three days. Gone. So are we, what's going to happen to the Cubs, you know? Um, I don't know that was good, man. I, I mean, I'm heartbroken. I'm numb, you know, about that. Yeah. Couldn't you keep one of those guys? You couldn't keep Rizzo? <laughs> Just keep Rizzo. I mean, he's Where did like, Rizzo go? He went to the Yankees. He's already hit three home runs in two <laughs> days for the Yankees. He's pretty excited to be out. It sucks, man. No, it's- he wasn't excited, dude. Look at his, look at his face in the video. He wasn't excited. He, he is, was sad. He's a joyless home run. He was sad, dude. He was sad. Yeah, picture being that. Picture hitting a home run in Yankee Stadium and being like sullen about it. I don't think he's sullen now. I think it lifted his spirits. Like having a bad set. Yeah, yeah. And then going and having a great set. And you go, oh yeah, don't worry about that bad set. Yeah. And I think he's fine now. But the day that that they let him go, that they traded him, he was not happy. You could tell he was. He wasn't yeah. angry. But you could see he was like, all good things come to an end. That was what he said. 
Where can the good people of uh, Bringing the Backups fandom find you? Yes, Stephen with a V, Lolly, L-O-L-L-I on YouTube. Hit the red button and subscribe. I have a podcast called The No Idea Zone. Uh, we are on break, but we're going into season three. And um, on Instagram, Lolly, Stephen, same spellings. Um, and on Twitter, Lolly Comedy. Cool. All right, brother. Well, it was look. great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Have a good one. Have a good one. That's the worst way I've ever ended a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to support us for free, there are many ways to do it. Start by subscribing on whatever platform you're currently listening on. If you're on Apple Podcasts, write a five-star review. And if you're on YouTube, like the video and leave a comment. On erichelwick.com, you can subscribe to the newsletter and click the track button to follow Eric's stand updates and never miss a show when he's in town. To support the podcast financially, visit the merch store via Eric's website. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next show.